Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live, the City Council update for March 10th, 2021. I am Joe Lynch, once again, joined by City Council President Matt McLaughlin. Matt McLaughlin, this weather is looking better every day. To some, yes. I'm a fan of winter. Oh, you know <laughs> what? We'll end this, we'll end this conversation now here. This is gonna, I think. Matt, this is going to bring some spirits up a little bit with 40, high 40s, low 50 degrees. There's our weather report. Matt, as usual, why don't you take it over from the high level of COVID reporting, vaccine reporting, and then we'll take it from there. Well, I will say that with the warm weather, people should remember to continue wearing masks. Um, I've seen a lot of people that I haven't seen in over a year, uh, which is a great thing, but uh, everyone treat, keep wearing your mask, keep washing your hands, keep six feet apart from people, all the same precautions we've been taking. I uh, wanna give a quick update on the vaccine rollout. Uh, all the information I'm gonna provide can be found on the City of Somerville website at somervillema.gov. And you can also call 211 uh, and go to mass.gov slash vaccine to schedule your vaccine. Uh, please note this information is constantly changing. The information uh, is as of Tuesday morning, March 3rd. Uh, all K through 12 educators, child care workers, and K through 12 school staff will be eligible for the vaccine starting this Thursday, March 11th. Um, you can go to mass.gov slash vaccine or call 211. Uh, keep in mind that the uh, wait times may be long, so you ha have to be patient. Uh, other individuals currently eligible for to be vaccinated include people over the age of 65, individuals with two or more health conditions, which you can find those conditions on the city's websites, or resident of staff in affordable senior housing. Uh, so anyone accompanying someone over 75 can also schedule for a vaccine. And there are many other categories. So the more vaccines we get, the more wide it's gonna open up. Uh, there are language lines for Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, and Nepali, Nepalese um, that people can contact. All this again on the City of Somerville website, somervillema.gov. Matt, thank you very much. I want to add one thing. This morning, uh, it was announced on uh, one of the national TV stations is that the current status of the vaccination program, and I, I want people to understand this, we only have 10, <clears throat> excuse me, 10% of our population that have been inoculated. So it goes back to what you were saying right at the very beginning, please continue to wear your masks, continue to uh, um, practice uh, hand hygiene, continue to practice physical distancing. This is not over. We have a long way to go. Do not become complacent because of the good weather. Do I, is that a little too militaristic me sounding, but I just want to make sure, Matt, people understand we have a long way to go in the vaccination program. Well, that's right. And I should also add to uh, my weekly uh, comment on anti-vaccine people um, that the CDC has recently come out with guidelines that if you are in a room with other people and you're vaccinated and they're all vaccinated, you don't need a mask. You can operate safely. Uh, and that's the goal. That's what we want to get to is everyone being vaccinated so we can go into the restaurant and have a nice meal without having to wear a mask. So a lot of people talk about how this is an individual choice, uh, but your individual choice to not get a vaccine makes uh, my individual choice to get a vaccine almost pointless. So we really need people to get the vaccine so we can get back to normal. And that's the message I have for everybody. <laughs> well, let's get back to normal. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. And I want to add one thing. This is going to be a conversation for another time. Hopefully we can get, um, you know, some other folks in here to talk about it as well. How do we know and how do we trust other people to tell us the truth that they've gotten vaccinated? That is something that's been eating away in the back of my mind for a long time. So a discussion for another day. Matt, we just recently last week, um, the city of Somerville in a slow rollout um, opened up the schools for certain grades, certain learners. Any update on that, on how well the rollout went last week? Well, I know the superintendent was very happy with the rollout and members of the school committee were happy that uh, we're starting to get students back in school. 
Uh, it's a slow trickle, prioritizing the most needy students, the students that need in-person learning the most. Uh, so the, that happened last week and it was very successful and we hope it's a sign that we're gonna be getting more students back to school soon. Great, Matt, why don't we do a quick lightning round um, and then I wanna turn it over to you. You have some agenda items you're gonna be talking about with the rest of the city council tomorrow night, Thursday night, as always, watch for it live on channel 22 or watch for the streaming from the city of Somerville website. The, uh, there seems to be an issue here with a group calling for a report about the school readiness and the shape of the buildings that the kids are going back into. Do we have an update on that and what the purpose of that request is for the council? No, I, I don't have an update on that. I have heard some concerns, but I haven't seen this, uh, like which group are we at? I guess I shouldn't speculate about it since I don't know, but I'd be interested in learning about that. Okay, then I'm gonna put a plug in for your, uh, your broadcast tomorrow night, Thursday night, seven o'clock, watch for more updates. Central Hill redesign, let me put that in context. Uh, what they call the Central Hill concourse or the Central Hill Park that is up at Government Center. So you have the City Hall, the brand new high school, the public library, all of that open space in front um, will be redesigned at some point and they are now in the planning process. Any update on that, Matt? Uh, no update outside of everything you just said. So it's a good planning process. Uh, Ward 3 City Council of Benue and Campen has been leading on it. I'm very excited about um, the changes to some of the veterans memorials that we're gonna make that a lot of uh, people from VFW um, and American Legion have participated in. So it's an exciting opportunity. It's one of the biggest green spaces in the city that the city actually owns uh, next to Foss Park, which is state-owned land. So it's a, it's a valuable piece of land and uh, the city's moving forward <coughs> in the process. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Matt. And of course, people don't get too excited about it because they, the vast majority of the Central Park system or the Central Hill Park system is still occupied by the pods that were put out there to accommodate student learning. Also, uh, the construction that is ongoing at the new high school. So this is the beginning of the planning process. And Matt, I wanna put a plug in as a veteran. I would love to see um, a redesign for our war memorials. Yep, that is in the works. So I'm looking forward to that especially. Thank you. Also on the agenda for tomorrow night, Matt, there's a discussion about releasing some information about your city council's executive session, releasing the transcripts. What's, what's that all about? Yeah, so for people who don't understand uh, what we're talking about, executive session is basically a, um, it's a meeting that is held uh, not in public uh, to discuss sensitive matters, and it's prescribed under the uh, state, the Commonwealth determines 10 specific categories where you can meet under executive session, things like union negotiations, uh, potential lawsuits or lawsuits that we're involved in, things that would have a negative impact if they were discussed publicly uh, can be discussed in executive session. But eventually when those matters are concluded, uh, those meeting minutes are public and they can have, people can request them for the public as we have already. Uh, or we can choose to release those uh, executive session minutes. So what's happening with that is we have a number of executive session minutes that need to be approved to be released to the public uh, that were a little delayed due to COVID-19 and all the issues that we've had in the past uh, past year. So that's what that is. Uh, it's a variety of topics, basically just approving, uh, releasing this information to the public. And I assume in those categories of things that you cannot or you would have to redact before you release any documents or sensitive personnel issues. Yeah, if, if, it's, if it's a sensitive matter or would still have an impact to this day, uh, it could be redacted. But one of the things I try to be very disciplined about both on the school committee and the city council is not discussing things that shouldn't be discussed in an executive session. So you don't have to go back and redact that information. Got it. So that it's really important that as much as possible, we have meetings in the public for everybody to see. Yeah, it tends to give the optics of secret meetings when you go into executive session. But 
you know, any of us who have uh, who have to deal with sensitive personnel issues understand why we go into executive session. So good luck with that one. One more, one more flash round here, Matt. There's also something on the agenda for tomorrow night about pilot programs. Pilot, the acronym stands for Payment in Lieu of Taxes. It is what um, we are guided by on federal and state laws. Um, we cannot tax certain not-for-profit organizations such as Tufts Universities, Partners Healthcare, religious institutions, educational institutions. But there is something that caught my eye there that somebody, I don't know who it is, wants to start taking a look at not-for-profits and how we incorporate them in a pilot program. Um, I assume that this is at the beginning of the, of the beginning stages of discussion. Anything more you can add to that one? Yeah, so I can't speak to these specific policy orders that I didn't put in, but uh, this is not the beginning of the conversation. We've actually had several policy orders in the past to address payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, the, one of the most recent ones that I submitted was to draft an ordinance that would formalize what payment in lieu of taxes is. So with billion dollar institutions like Tufts or Partners, uh, right now the, it's basically a handshake and a smile. That's how the deals are made. It's uh, left completely up to the executive to make a deal uh, with Tufts or with partners or with another nonprofit on what they should pay. And then lots of times those institutions don't even pay what they agreed upon. So I have an ordinance that is going to be, uh, it's already been introduced and it's going to be discussed in legislative matters to formalize that and say, this is specifically what we expect of you. And uh, not to have this every few years, have a behind closed doors negotiation uh, where we have very little leverage, just say out front, like the, the thing that came to mind with this when I first introduced it is nobody else is allowed to negotiate what they pay in taxes. And we shouldn't have that for the billion dollar institutions either. So that's what that ordinance will do. And just to be completely clear on it is there's only so much we can do because this is state and federal law uh, regarding nonprofits that make them exempt from paying taxes. So there's only so much we can do, but I do think it's best to have everything on the table, uh, very clear what our expectations are. So if those expectations aren't met, we know where to go from that. And quite frankly, Matt, there are three major, major categories of exempt, tax exempt. And when we talk about tax exempt, we're talking about the property that they own in our community. We're talking about property taxes in the payment in lieu of taxes. So these are organizations that own their own property and do not have to pay the real estate tax to the city of Somerville. Here's my point though, we have three categories of that. We have religious institutions, educational institutions, and uh, medical institutions. So are, are we gonna slice and dice this? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna get you into a position where you can't answer most of these questions, but are we also gonna try to rope in religious institutions into this? Because as you know, the Catholic church, the Jewish faith, the Protestant uh, organizations all own property in the city. Are we gonna to try to rope them into pilot, pilot, uh, the pilot program? Yeah, so again, I, I don't know what the intentions of other councils are when it comes to these uh, new policy orders, but mine would cover billion dollar institutions. And uh, I don't see religious institutions as a part of that, even if they're owned by the Catholic church, they're, run and operated by a uh, local diocese, which probably doesn't have a billion dollars. Uh, so my, my priority is uh, the billion dollar institutions, groups that operate as a business essentially, uh, but have this tax, they, they have this tax exempt status. So th that's where I'm at on it. Okay, more to come. There's only, there's only a few organizations like Tufts and Partners that this would even apply to. More to come, thank you, Matt. Matt, why don't you take it over? There were some things that you wanted to discuss directly and uh, take it away. Yeah, so I have two policy orders in this week uh, that are not currently on the agenda because I'm waiting for some final language. Uh, one is to address pollution uh, issues on I-93. So right now uh, we have a, in our zoning, a requirement for open space and civic space. And developers, if they don't want to make that or they can't make the civic space work, are allowed to uh, give a payout. 
uh, and that payout goes to open space. However, one of my big issues has always been air pollution on I-93. And what I'm proposing now is to allow developments along I-93 to be exempt from building open space because we really don't want open space built by highways because of the pollution issue. Uh, allow them to have a buyout and have that money go towards pollution mitigation rather than open space. And Can you give me an example of pollution mitigation, Matt? Uh, for me, the big one is sound barriers on I-93. I would love to have that completed. Uh, sound barriers have proven to uh, stop pollution from seeping into communities that are a few hundred feet from the highway, which is the case in East Somerville. Uh, we could also have tree barriers. It could also be open space as well. Uh, if the open space was meant with the specific purpose of mitigating pollution on I-93. So this is a local effort um, because we really can't get the federal transportation folks or the state transportation folks to build those barriers. So we're trying to take this on ourselves. Yeah, it's been something I've been trying to take on for since I've been in office and not getting much support from the state and federal Federal government's not even aware of this, I'm sure, but the state government is aware uh, that we have this problem and have basically told us that sound barriers in particular are not something that they're willing to build to address air pollution. And they would say that uh, the sound barriers, basically there's a list, we're not on the list and the list is very long and they won't put us on the list. So that, that's been the problem. So. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get the money, if a developer wants to build along a highway, get some money to address air pollution. And that's gonna be introduced tomorrow, both a zoning amendment, which would allow developers to build by highways without open space, but in exchange for that, having money to address air pollution. How successful do you think that's gonna be with the developers? You think you're gonna get pushback from them and saying, why are you asking us to mitigate pollution on a highway that we had nothing to do with? No, more than anything, they're the ones who want it because they, they don't want uh, to be held to this open space standard, especially when, when they can't deliver on it. And if they did deliver on it, would lead to some public health issues. Uh, so I think that this is a fair compromise uh, because basically it's saying you take 100% of how much it would cost to build open space uh, and instead of doing that, making uh, contributing to air pollution mitigation. So, so it's, a, uh, it's a neutral move for them. They're not expected to do anything more than what they already are expected. I, I, I'm, I'm sensing that there is a compromise here somewhere. It's not pie in the sky. There is a compromise someplace. We could accomplish what you have been advocating for. Uh, many of us who live along the railroad tracks in the city of Somerville, in the old days of you know the budliners and the and the freight trains, we would constantly complain about the pollution that would come from those engines, and we're never successful in trying to get the federal or the state government doing anything about it. But it sounds like it is not the perfect solution to particulate travel. Uh, sorry, my words um, to mitigating the pollution for those residents and businesses that abut our highway system. Is, is I-93, Matt, really the target? Is that the target of this? I-93 and McGrath Highway, yes. Got uh, it. We have proof uh, through studies from Tufts University that the fine particulate matter in this area is intense and has led to serious public health issues with people who live close to it. How often do they update the study, Matt? Uh, they're still doing the study to this day. I, and I participate in it. I just got an email uh, asking me to once again put air filters in my apartment um, to basically like I participated in the study with the Somerville Transit Equity Partnership and uh, Half Trap as they're known, uh, these air filters, uh, where they're studying the effects of air filters on highway pollution. And I'm helping uh, them get residents to volunteer for this program, which involves uh, getting blood tests and checking people's breathing and the study is ongoing, uh, but we know the problem is real. So Matt, this, when you talk about the study, this is the study by advocates out of the STEP organization with Ellen Reisner and Wig Zaymore and a lot of other people who are very, very concerned about the particulate matter, 
pollution that was emanating from our major roadways. So you, you tickled my brain cells when you were talking about that because I can remember following that in the early stages. You're still participating in that as a resident of that area. Is that right? Yes, I'm participating in it and trying to get other residents to do so. And I should also add that um, the Green Line extension that we are now getting that we've spent $50 million on, uh, we got that because of a lawsuit, uh, because of pollution on I-93, because it was decided that we uh, would be negatively impacted by air pollution. So we need some solutions. And one of the solutions was a Green Line. And although many people are happy the Green Line is coming, it is going to do absolutely nothing to address air pollution on I-93 because the amount of cars that have been on the road since that decision has increased so dramatically that the green line will not, it will not address air pollution on I-93. So I'm the trying to get money to do specifically that. There's the conundrum though. We negotiated, we got something, but it didn't take care of the problem directly for those folks that have bought I-93 on McGrath Highway. Exactly. Yep. Well. Negotiating is an art. I, I'm never gonna say it's a, the art of the deal, but negotiating is uh, negotiating for the short and the long term. So you are still fighting the good fight to mitigate that particulate pollution that comes off the highways. Anything else on that, Matt? Or you wanna move on to the next? Uh, yeah, so the other thing that I'm introducing um, that I'm working with the police department and the mayor's office on is developing a policy around uh, drug possession arrests uh, as opposed to drug distribution. Uh, so it's been our my understanding for the past few years since I've been in office that drug possession is not a priority for the police department as far as arrests and we're prioritizing treatment over incarceration. Uh, so I'm having the I'm requesting the chief of police come and discuss this uh, to discuss what our current policy is, what we could do better and to provide some data on uh, who has been arrested and how many people have been arrested for possession as opposed to distribution. Is this all part of the police reform effort that we are um, involved with? I, I, this is my own personal preference, Matt. I don't like calling it defund the police because that, that's kind of a red herring to me. But what we're trying to do is evaluate how the police in this city and across the country utilize their funding um you know is there a better way in the criminal justice system to treat um folks who are are who possess certain amount of whatever drug whatever you want to call it um or people who commit um minor or misdemeanor type of offenses but wind up in the prison pipeline or people who see a police a, a police force that's out of control um, because they're not abiding by uh, human rights or uh, civil rights. Is this all part of that um, program? I guess you could say it's all connected, uh, but I would point out that I introduced this in 2014, uh, which was well before defund the police and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and all these connected issues. Uh, and this, to me, the root of this is the war on drugs, which has had a horrible impact on communities of color and my community as well, people that I grew up with. Uh, I do not think that it is beneficial to society to arrest and lock people up for having a public health issue, for having an addiction uh, and struggling with that addiction. It doesn't serve anybody to imprison them. It costs money to imprison them. I, they end up not being able to get jobs when they get out. They're not getting the treatment that's needed. So it's all connected, but I, I would say that this is, it's a decades long problem that began with the war on drugs and has had a devastating impact on this community. So regardless of uh, who, who is promoting what or what the political slogan is at the time, I think that this is I try to focus all my efforts on what actually impacts people's lives directly. And I've, I've been directly impacted by the war on drugs. A lot of people in this community have. And if we could develop a policy that uh, would address addiction as a disease instead of a crime, uh, that's what I'm here for. And I think a lot of it, Matt, to be honest with you, I think a lot of it uh, goes back to how we view mental health issues. Um, addiction, can be directly linked 
to a mental health issue. Um, poverty is linked directly to mental health issues, which could possibly lead to addiction issues. So treating the person holistically rather than as a criminal, I think is where we're all trying to get to because people who suffer from mental health issues are not criminals. They are people who have a con medical condition. This is my, Matt, you're gonna regret giving me this little soapbox, but people who have mental health issues should not be treated as criminals. And I've always, that's my credo. Um, they have a medical condition. We have to figure out how to assist them because if you don't assist and treat the mental health issue, that could spiral right out of control through, throughout society. Yeah, and I think that this is a subject that a lot of Republicans would agree with as well. You hear Republicans talking about ending the war on drugs, which is a huge government program, uh, as well as addressing mental health. Whenever, whenever issues come up, uh, they like, such as shootings or violence or things like this, they often to defer to, we need mental health treatment. And I would agree with that. I would maybe not agree with the content, con the uh, context that they're bringing it up in, but we need to treat people like human beings and not like criminals. If they're not, if they're only harming themselves, um, then this, uh, to me, it's not something to lock someone up over. It's something to get help for them. And I do believe there's broad support for that across the country right now. It's a long discussion. It's a complicated discussion. And I think if elected officials start listening carefully and understand the motivation of groups who are trying to figure it out, um, I think that's going to benefit all of us. But we always have to be careful of the optics of what we call a certain program, because you could turn people off just by the name, the nomenclature that we use. Matt, yeah. you know, I, I, well, one of these days we're going to have to go to an hour because I, I, I enjoy having these conversations with you. Anything else you wanna wrap up with? I'm giving the signal here. Well, I just wanna say in terms of the messaging of what you just said is like, I do wanna make it clear to people, you know, when you talk about decriminalizing drugs, you talk about treatment over incarceration, some people think that you're trying to legalize drugs or you're trying to make them more readily accessible to people. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to treat a disease and address the fact that locking people up is not the solution. So you see the state like Oregon uh, recently decriminalized all drugs, but you can still get a ticket for possessing drugs. You can be required to go uh, to drug treatment through the courts. You're just not gonna have a felony conviction on you, which is gonna follow you for the rest of your life. Uh, so that's important for people to understand. This isn't about legalizing drugs or making drugs more accessible to people. It's about treating a disease. Let's do a show on it, Matt. I'll try to format it and we'll get someone who is in the mental health industry and we'll try to do a show on it. But yeah, for now, sure. Matt, thank you so much for the Somerville Media Center. I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.